Welcome to Purpose of Life Ministries, where we want you to find your purpose, live your purpose, and share your purpose. Please join the service in progress as Pastor David W. Green Sr. shares a word from his series, Come. If you're in the Indianapolis area, we would love for you to visit one of our three services on Sunday at 8 a.m., 10 a.m., or noon. We're located at 3705 Kessler Boulevard, North Drive in Indianapolis. Here, my oldest daughter Josh and my son Josh Jr. 
the other two babies are away, but we really thank God for them and their absence. Just ask that you to continue to keep me and my family in prayers. Uh, Job, we're going to begin uh, reading at verse 6 of the very first chapter. Uh, and I, I put on Facebook the other day that, um, that when I preached this morning, I was going to be preaching to myself because sometimes... You know, the song says we have to encourage ourselves. And I think sometimes as ministers, we don't really understand the power that our preaching has to not only the people that hear it, but to ourselves. So sometimes you need to just really take time to get in touch with, with who God is in his word and really just kind of be in tune and minister to yourself. So so if you would, I was just, I'm, I'm, I'm telling y'all right now, I'm not sure what God is getting ready to do. But this word is very personal. And I pray that it touches your heart this morning. Job, the first chapter, we're going to begin reading that verse 6 from the King James Version. It reads, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came also among them. The Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? The Lord Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. Verse number 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered... My servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for nothing? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? And thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the hand. But put forth thy hand now, and touch all that he had, and he will curse thee to thy face. Listen to what the Lord says. The Lord says unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in thy power, but do not touch him. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Let's jump down to verse 20. Then Job arose and ripped his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped. And Job says, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's real quick go back to verse 8. I want to redirect your attention to verse 8. And it says, the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, but there is none like him in all the earth? Father, it's preaching time now, and I ask you, God, that as I preach, that you would decrease me, God, so that your word can increase God, allow me to preach to these your people. Let nothing that I say fall upon deaf ears, God, but that someone's heart may be pricked, someone may be quickened, and that someone be changed. God now asks that as I preach, God, that no one would see me, but that they would hear you and see you through me. In Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. I just want to entertain your attention for a few moments and preach from this subject and ask the question, God, why me? God, why me? Me. Within, within the English language, there are recorded seven words by which we understand and signify asking or requesting. Uh, these words that we learned while we were in school are very synonymous with us. I'm pretty sure all of you have heard of them. And we can readily identify these seven words by who, what, when, where, why. And then we also have will and even how. Who is associated with a specific person or a certain group of people? Commonly asking who someone is or who they are. What is associated by specific things or objects? Commonly asking what something is. When is associated with a specific time or season in which something takes place or occurs? Commonly asking when will or when does something happen? Where is associated with a specific location, region, or point of position? commonly referring to the whereabouts of certain events taking place. How is associated by the definite process by which something is manifested, commonly asking the question, how did, to what degree, or by which means something takes place or happens. But my brothers and my sisters this morning, of all of the questions that we have, uh, most oftentimes the question that we ask is the one of why. Uh, if we don't ask the question why on a weekly basis, sometimes we find ourselves saying this on a daily basis, and we continually ask the question why. And most of the time when we ask this question, it's always because we really don't have any, if any, of the answers at all. And so a lot of times when we have questions and we don't have the answers, we begin to ask 
why? Especially when we find ourselves going through what we're going through and we really don't know why we're even going through, we simply have to stop and take inventory and ask the question, why? We ask, why did this have to happen? Or instead, why didn't this happen? Why would everything that could go wrong all at once, why is it happening now? And not just why, but God, why me? We have to make this thing personal because a lot of times we, we ask everybody else why something is happening, but we never take the time to ask ourselves why. And so since we're selfish, we have to look up to God and ask him why, because he is the all-powerful God. Of course, he made the heavens and the earth. He's the same God that stepped out on nothing and made everything. And so we have to attribute something to him, and we have to ask him, God, why me? Why, why is it my house, God? Why, why my car? Why, why my job? Why my husband? Why my wife? Why my kids? Why my mama? Why my daddy? God, I need to know why. God, seriously, I need your help, and I need to know not just why, God, but God, why me? The word why is a noun which is defined as a question concerning the cause of, the reason for which something is done, accomplished or achieve. Even as a conjunction, why is defined for what cause or reason for which on account of which usually after reason to introduce a relative clause, being the reason as to why something happens. I would be out of mind if I give y'all a little English this morning. Most of us, if we be honest with ourselves, whenever we ask the question why, we are indeed looking for answers as to why. And especially, it's kind of funny how all of these, all of these seven questions seem to come together when we don't have the answers. We wonder who got us in this situation. What exactly is this that I'm going through? When did all of this happen? Where did all of this come from? How am I going to come out of this? Will I ever get out of this? And last but not least, why am I in this in the first place? And so we have to use all of these things together because the Bible says in Romans 8 chapter verse 28 that all things work together for the good to them that love God. But we don't understand why all of these go together because we still don't understand why. But it's important, my brothers and sisters, that we understand the purpose behind our pain. We must discover the significance of our situation, and we must unmask the story of our storm and ultimately celebrate the triumph in our testimony. So I hope you haven't closed your Bibles. Uh, as we look at this text, we recognize here uh, this very familiar story about a man whose name was Job. And we're also in the book of Job, which is the first book of the wisdom books, and it deals with pain and suffering. And who better to help us to understand this morning, my brothers and my sisters, what pain and suffering yeah. is really like other than the man named Job? Yeah. Uh, one thing that sticks out about Job is his name alone. I know it sounds funny because Job just is, is kind of weird. It sounds funny. I know we see the word Job and we associate job. Yeah. But Job, his name alone means one persecuted. Now, that's kind of funny to me because why? Would someone name him Job if his name was meant one persecuted? So that means that just as sure as he was born, he was sure to endure some persecution. And see, sometimes you have to understand that even when we name our children, you have to be careful what you name your child because what you name your child is what they're birthed into. But yet still, we deal with Job. We deal with Job. Job is this man who was face to face with Satan on several occasions in the Bible. But yet he remained faithful to God in spite of his sufferings, his afflictions, and his loss. The book of Job in the Old Testament canon is a wisdom literature of which the epistle of James in the New Testament is his example. And it deals with the broad realm of the humanistic experience and is set forth in short proverbs, essays, monologues, and in the case of Job, drama. So although the, although the author of this book is not mentioned in Ezekiel 14 and 14, I believe, uh, and also in James, chapter 5, verse 11, uh, it refers to Job as a historical person because he lived in a very high, uh, hierarchy time. He was, he was one to be known who traveled from various regions in the Bible, and it also mentions the absence of the law in the tabernacle or in the temple. But we also must realize that the book of Job directly deals with man's relationship with God. In other words, what I do in my daily life means absolutely nothing if I do not have covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we have to understand that as we walk as Christians, nothing that we do matters if we do not have God on our side. Uh, there's a lot of things in the book of Job, but one thing about Job that sticks out to me is a man by the name of Elihu who explained Job's suffering with God's chastening him 
and to view with experiential purification and to reach higher ground, but he also fell short of the answer. In other words, every single thing that Job went through in his life, he didn't have the answer, neither did anyone else. And so isn't that real funny? Because a lot of times when we come to the house of God, isn't it funny how you notice that everybody in church always has something to say about what you're going through, when you're going through, how you're going through it, and why you're going through it. And when in reality, they are going through just as much foolishness as you're going through. They're going through just as much trial and tribulation as you have. And these are the same people who are more concerned with becoming public successes other than being private failures. So we have to understand it was not until God revealed himself and his own majesty and power in chapters 38 through 41 that Job, as the Bible says, he was a perfect and an upright man. Although he was, he turned from his own goodness and confessed, wherefore I abhor myself and I repent in dust and in ashes. Then it was after having seen himself to be in the worst condition of his life that Job then emerges from suffering to blessings and restoration. And my brothers and sisters, I'll stop by just for a few moments just to let you know that just as Job went through and came out, you too must go through and endure the process before you can see any progress as promised in Scripture. Well, the Bible tells us that the race is not given to the swift, neither the battle to the strong, but it's given to the one that endured to the end. See, we believe and we sing it all the time that no weapon is formed against the shell prophet. But see, the problem is, it does not negate the fact that the problem, that the uh, weapon that's formed against it shall not be formed. Now, the Bible says that it won't prosper, but that still does not mean that it won't be formed. We also believe that God will make our enemies our footstools, but we still get an attitude when the very first person talks about us. We believe that God will make our enemies our footstools, but just as soon as somebody talks about us, we get upset. We also believe that, that God would never put more on us than we're able to bear. But just as soon as he puts the first thing on us, we begin to cry. We believe that weeping may endure for a night, but that joy comes in the morning. But we get so content with crying all night long, we have not learned how to lift up our eyes into the hills from which cometh our help. And we cannot continue. We cannot we cannot continue to say that we believe in God for something, but we're not willing to go through anything. And the question is, the question is, this is what bothers me. What do you do? What do you do when your situation becomes your assignment? What, what, what do you do when, what do you do when your bills become your assignment? What, what do you do when sickness becomes your assignment? What do you do when, when layoff becomes your assignment? Your immediate responsibility is to go through with your assignment. Just as you're on your job and your boss hands you your assignment, your immediate responsibility is to complete the task that's at hand. But most of us are too busy looking for promotion. Okay. See, see that's the thing. See, we have our assignment. But we too busy trying to look past the assignment and get promoted. You ever been on a job and you knew for a fact that you was on a 90-day probationary period and you, you, you know, you was on time the first two weeks and, and you know, that was cool and, you know, you, you, you even came real early, one or two days, you even brought donuts, brought a couple of milk, but that still didn't negate the fact that you was on a 90-day probationary period, so all of the stuff that you was doing really didn't mean anything because you still got about 65 days more left, but you felt like, well, you know what, I've done enough in these first two weeks, I'm ready to be promoted. You cannot be promoted until you become overqualified for your present assignment. Hold on, y'all missed that. Let me say it again. Some of y'all are too busy looking for to be promoted, but you cannot be promoted until you become overqualified for your present assignment. Your assignment is not your decision, it's your discovery. You cannot wake up in the morning and tell God what you're going to be. You have to discover what the purpose is on the inside of you. And anytime you discover who God wants you to be, that's when you will discover your enemy. And the importance of your assignment is revealed by the intensity of your adversary. The adversary's job is to steal, to kill, and destroy. But your immediate responsibility is to resist the devil and he should flee. Now whether you want him to or not, he's still going to show up. But the promise is, if you learn how to defeat the enemy, you will walk in victory. You can't run and you can't hide from the enemy, but God can hide you. How do I know? For the Bible tells me, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in the secret place of his, of his tabernacle. And any time the enemy comes in like a flood, I wish I could preach it here like I want to. Any time the enemy comes in like a flood, the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. David said, when my enemies, as 
and my foes, when they come up on me to eat of my flesh, they stumble and they fail. I wish I had some Bible reading in here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Even though victory is promised to the believer, it's still the process. You will never win a race until you first learn how to run. You will never win a fight until you first get into the ring. You will never learn to swim until you learn how to get into the water. And you will never know what real victory feels like until you've experienced a few losses. But thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And at the end of all of this is how you handle your opposition that takes you to your next position. Y'all be seated. Y'all be seated. Y'all be seated. Y'all be seated. So whenever you feel like asking the question, Whenever you feel like asking the question, God, why me? God will do something really funny because you know God has a great sense of humor. God likes when we get upset. He likes when we get frustrated. He likes when we get frustrated because we will say, God, why me? God won't give us an answer, but then he'll turn right back and look at you and say, well, you know what? Why not you? Why not you? Let's go back to the book. Three points, and I promise y'all get out your way. I know y'all hungry. Let me get out your way. The first reason that you're going through why you're going through is, number one, let me just go ahead and tell you this, because you've been handpicked. Yeah, that's, that's the reason why you, you've been handpicked. In the book of Jeremiah, I believe, chapter one, God speaks to the prophets, and he says to him, he says, before I formed thee out of the belly, I knew thee, and before thou came out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee, and I made thee a prophet unto the nation, which gives me a clear indication that God obviously had me on his mind before I could put him on mine. Uh, uh, yeah, he later again in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, he says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of good and not of evil, to give you an expected end. So in order for you to do anything, be anything, or even go through anything, God himself has to choose you and allow you to go through it. You need more proof. Well, let's look here back in our text, Job chapter 1. If we look back at verse 6, it says that now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, hey man, where are you going? Satan looked back and said, yo, I'm walking around in the earth trying to figure out who I'm going to mess with. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the Bible. I know, I, I, you know, some of y'all don't understand King James. I'm just figured I give y'all King Josh. Is that all right? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm in the Bible. Don't, don't get nervous. I'm in the Bible. I'm in the Bible. And so, and so Job, you know, he, he asked him, and then the Lord says unto him in, chapter, in uh, verse number eight, he says, hast thou considered my boy Job? You ain't, you ain't, you ain't looked at Job? Job got it going on. Job is that dude, man. You know, he's got a good job. He's got a good wife. You know what I'm saying? He's working at Eli Lilly. He making about 80 a year. You know, his wife is fine. He's driving a binge. You know, Job got it going on. So if you're looking for somebody to mess with, you need to go get Job. That's my boy. Have you, have you not considered Job? You worried about everybody else over here. What about Job? Now, I know a lot of us will read this text and then we would get upset and we would take it personal because a lot of us feel like Job sometimes. Yeah. Now, 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 God, what are you talking about now? Now, I've, I've been coming to church every single week. Yeah. I've been tithing sometimes. Um, I've, been, I've been faithful. You know, I come to Sunday school, you know, once, maybe twice a month. Oh, y'all quiet. I must be talking. That's all right. Let me know. But he, but he says to him, he says, you know, have you considered Job? And a lot of us feel like Job because we feel like we're perfect and we're upright. And we're doing everything that we're supposed to do. And that's when God says, get that person. Get the one that's coming to church. Get the one that's singing in the choir. Get the one that's doing everything that I've been telling them to do. But then we get upset because we looking at Pookie and Ray Ray and them and they over there smoking weed and getting high and they living better than we are. And they, oh, y'all don't know Pookie and Ray Ray and they're doing better than us. Okay. But that's the thing. See, we, we make this thing personal. We make ourselves Job. And we think to ourselves, why would God knowingly allow Job, one who was said to be perfect and upright, one that feared God and he eschewed evil? Why would God allow him to be attacked by the devil? God, what was you thinking? What did he ever do to deserve this? Make it personal. God, what did I ever do to deserve this? And just as when we get in trouble, the first thing we do is ask, what did I do? to deserve this. So God, you mean to tell me that you being omniscient, being that you know all things, not only knew 
what the devil was going to do before he even did it, but you allowed it to happen because when you chose Job to be the very one that the devil will pursue. But before you get too upset at God or confused by what the devil is trying to do in your life, you have to understand that the devil can't attack you or even get close to you without God's permission to do so. In other words, the will of God won't carry you where the grace of God can't keep you. Come on, let me say that again. Some of y'all missed it. I said the will of God won't carry you where the grace of him will keep you. God will keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on him. The devil knows that you love God. He knows that you fear God. He knows that you serve him wholeheartedly. He knows for a fact that you standing on the door of ushering every single week. Emory, he knows you play the organ. David, he knows you play the drum. Demetrius, he knows you're leading praise and worship. But that's why you're in line for an attack. Because he sees you. You know, the number one thing about it is the reason why the devil attacks you is because you only remind him of what he used to do. He knows that you speak in some kind of tongue, but no matter what your gift, you know, your calling in the ministry is, it does not disqualify you for attack. If anything, it overqualifies you for one. The devil will never attack or pursue anyone who is not a threat to him nor his kingdom. In retrospect, if he does not attack you, then that must mean y'all on the same side. Come on, touch somebody next to you. Say, whose side are you leaning on? Come on, ask and say, whose side are you leaning on? Whose side are you leaning on? Yeah, 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 yeah. Whose side, whose side, whose side are you leaning on? He only attacks those whom he knows God has favored, whom God has chosen. Those who are predestined, those who are preordained for greatness, those whom God has anointed and specifically chosen for a particular purpose. That's why the devil tries to attack your mind because he knows that he will keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on it. That's why he attacks your children because he knows if you train them up in the way that they should go, when they are old, they will not depart from it. That's why he attacks your finances because he knows that if you give, it'll be pressed down, shaken together, and running over. He knows that if you keep on giving, that God has the ability to open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive. That's why he attacks your marriage because he understands that what God has joined together. I'm not talking about Match.com or eHarmony.com or BlackPeopleMeet.com or let's go to the church and get hooked up.com. But he understands that what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. That's why it's important, my brothers and my sisters, and I know it's Father's Day, I know y'all was looking for me to say something about being a good father, but let me just throw this in here real quick. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, it says, Be not equally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And let me just go ahead and throw this in here for free. If they don't love God, you better not fall in love with them. Listen, listen, I, I, I don't want to be out of order, but let me just go ahead and throw this out there too. I don't care how good it is. Y'all missed what I said. I said, I don't care how good it is. Yeah, y'all catch that on your way home. If they don't love God, don't you fall in love with them. They ain't got no business with God. You ain't got no business loving them in the first place. God will never authorize a man to marry a woman who refuses to submit no more than he would a man to marry a woman to marry a man who refuses to lead. Two cannot walk together except they agree. So when the devil sees unity, he's ready to attack because he wants to see you divided. He wants to see you hate each other because he hates himself. He really only hates you because you remind him of what he wants to do because his attacks are limited due to the fact that while he may have God's permission to pursue you, God still shows up and he places a head of protection around you. Which brings me to my second point. The reason why you're going through is not only have you been handpicked, but God says you can handle it. You don't believe me. Let's go back to verse 10. I, I'm trying to stay in the Bible. Let's go look at verse 10. The devil looks at him and he says, God, hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he had on every side? Thou hast blessed the works of his hand and the substance is increased in the land. That sounds like favor to me. When God favors you, he places a hedge of protection around you because he doesn't want anything corrupt to get upon you. Not only does he pin, pan pick you, he equips you so that you can handle it. He puts this hedge of protection around not only Job, but around his wife, 
and his children. And that's why it's important, brothers, while you're in here, to be the man that God is calling you to be. So not only that he can protect you, so that he can protect your wife and protect your family and protect your children. Because you have to understand that the steps of a good man, the Bible says, are ordered by the Lord. David declared in Psalms 34 and 7 that the angel of the Lord, he encamps round about them that fear them and deliver them. Not only was Job equipped with a hedge of protection, he was equipped with favor. Again, in verse 10, it says that all that he had on every side, thou hast blessed the works of his hand, and his substance is increased in the land. So that means that not only whatever he had in his hand, it kept continuing to increase. And when God releases the unprecedented power of his favor on your life, the very devil in the hell that seeks to destroy you shall be destroyed. Every yoke of bondage that tries to consume you shall be broken. God's favor attack binds the attacks of the enemy. Favor can carry you even when your faith can't. Let me say that again. You see, sometimes a lot of us, we lose faith when we get in certain situations. But when you got God's favor on you, you don't even need faith. You need proof. Okay. That's why it's important of not being a conditional praiser. Watch this. Watch this. See, a, continue, uh, 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 a conditional praiser can only praise God when they get a house. But a real praiser knows how to praise God in a one-bedroom studio apartment. See, see, a conditional praiser can only praise God when they get a brand new car. But a real praiser can praise God in a Honda store. See, I don't want to hear them. See, a real praiser can praise God when they only got 16 cents in the bank. See, a conditional praiser only praise God when they win the lottery. And you ain't got no business crashing them tickets anyway. Okay, see, see, the blessings of the Lord make it rich and addeth no sorrow. Favor can carry you from having bad health to supernatural healing. Favor can carry you from a divorce court to a 50-year wedding anniversary. David again declares in Psalms 5 and 12, For thou, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor, wilt thou compass him as a shield. In Deuteronomy 11 and 24, the unmerited favor, God promises us that every place wherein the soles of our feet shall tread shall be ours, even from the wilderness in Lebanon, from the river Euphrates, and even unto the uttermost part of the sea, it shall be our coast. And see, sometimes you got to learn that sometimes when your faith can't do it, your favor can. But just in case you do got faith, sometimes you have to learn how to put your mouth where your favor is. How, what are you talking about? What are you talking about, preacher? Because in Philippians 4.13, see, sometimes you can't just have it on the inside. You got to be able to open up your mouth and say, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. See, sometimes you got to go home and look dead in the mirror and get the mirror dead in the face and say, you know what? I am the head and not the tail. You are above only and not beneath. You are the lender and not the borrower. You can't just do all things but you can handle all things. You do look good. You do got it going on. You can make it. Sometimes you just got to look in the mirror and encourage yourself. He promised. He promised us. Not only can we handle it, but he can handle it even when we can't. He can handle it even when we feel like we're by ourselves. But in Matthew, the 28 and the Great Commission, I love this because God says, and lo, I am with you always even until the end of the world. He promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us. And you can handle it even when it doesn't look good. You can handle it even when you don't see how to handle it. Even when you don't know why, you can still handle it. But you must first believe that you can when your fear says that you can't. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And whenever you allow fear to step in, then that means that your faith has just walked out. Although fear is a spirit, your faith is a shield. Fear may last for a moment, but it's only temporary. But your faith is eternal within it dwells with inside of your spirit. So in other words, it's up to your faith to let your fear know when its services are no longer needed. I need somebody to go home and just say, you know what, fear? You out of here. You out of here. Come on, kick fear out of your house and say, fear, yeah. You up out of here. You up out of here. The Bible says we must learn how to lay aside every sin and the weight that so easily beset us and looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finish of our faith. God's only pain is to be doubted, yet his only pleasure is to be believed. For he that cometh to God may first, but must first believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently 
seek him. I'm on my way to my seat, my third point. Not only have you been handpicked, not only can you handle it, but if you learn how to handle it, my third point is I promise I'm going home. God says you can come out with your hands up. Job was handpicked to be attacked by the devil, but God equipped Job with a hedge of protection around him so that he could handle it in the end. Job would then come out of it with his hands up. You don't believe me? Go down to verse 20. And Job looks up and he says, uh, he arose and ripped off his clothes and he shaved his head and he fell down upon the ground and he worshiped. Yeah. Now, I don't understand because, God, you've taken everything that Job has. Yeah. You've stripped him of everything that he has. Job has now lost his wife. Yeah. He's lost his children. He's lost his car. Job has lost everything, all of his possessions. He's lost his land. And at the end of all this, Job, you mean to tell me with your foolish self that you had the nerve to strip down and embarrass yourself and get butt naked in front of everybody and say naked came out of my mother's womb and naked should I return. Then he has enough nerve to look up towards the heaven and say the Lord gives and the Lord has taken away. Well surely he took everything you had. But then he has enough sense to say blessed be the name of the Lord. Now I don't understand Job, you've lost everything. How in the world are you coming out with your hands up? Because he says, blessed be the name of the Lord. And then, even in verse 22, it says, and in all of this, Job sinned not, nor did he charge God foolishly. Now, let me, let me bring this home. Let me explain something to you. Now, Job suffered much in his lifetime. And although he was said to be a righteous man and a perfect man and an upright man, his name means one persecuted, meaning he was born to go through. But because he remained faithful to God, Job was able to come out with his hands up. See, Job understood that in order to get to the next level, he needed to stop looking at where he was. And then he decided where he would rather be. And the place where Job decided he would rather be was inside of the will of God. I believe it was Karen Clark Shear, one of my favorite singers, that sung a song that said the safest place in the whole wide world was in the will of God. Job understood that God never consults your past to determine your future. But rather he recognized that his temporary address was not his permanent dwelling place. In verse 21, Job steps out of faith even in the midst of persecution and makes a personal decree. He decrees and he declares that the Lord gave and the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And isn't it amazing, it isn't amazing how Job could still bless the Lord after losing everything. And I realized that even on today, though this story may have happened years and upon years and upon years ago, there's one of my other favorite singers by the girl by the name of Fantasia who says, sometimes you've got to lose to win again. Job has lost his family, he has lost his wife and his children. And all of his possessions are now gone, even his health. But because of his obedience and faithfulness to God, he was getting ready to be restored. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Emory, I feel like I'm ready to go home now. But my question to you is, my brothers and my sisters, is how are you gonna praise God after you lose everything? Yeah, how are you gonna praise God when you don't have no money in the bank. How are you going to praise God when all hell is going loose? I stopped by to tell you this morning, uh, all you have to do is throw up your hands. Uh, and when you throw up your hands, uh, it's a sign of surrender. It's a sign that you've done all you can do. It's a sign that now you're ready to give up and to give in. But if you're going to give in, make sure you give it to Jesus. And I can imagine now, Brother Job, when he was at his lowest point, Job had to put his head down. But God said, now is not the time to hold your hands down. But you've got to learn how to hold your head up and put your hands up even higher. Because when your head is down, you can't see where you're going. You can't see how you're going to make it. But when you lift up your head, you can lift up your eyes unto the hills for which cometh your help. And you can know that all of your help comes from the Lord 
who made the heavens and the earth. Whenever you choose to trust God, you got to learn how to let go of what's in your hand. And when you let go of what's in your hand, God will let go of what's in his hand. What's in his hand, preacher? Well, I'm so glad you asked me. In his presence is the fullness of joy. In his right hand are pleasures evermore. There's healing in his hand. There's joy in his hand. There's peace in his hand. There's love in his hand. We used to sing a song, whatever the problem, I put it all in his hand. No matter the problem, I put it all in his hand. Cause I know Jesus can solve it. I put it all in his hand. And my favorite part is this and that, which means no matter what it is, even when you can't put a name on it, you can still put it all in his hands, all in his hands. Show him put it in the master's hand so that he can learn how to lift up his own hands. Job came out of his trouble huh, with his hands up, huh, with his life renewed, huh, with his joy restored, huh, with his strength revived, huh, and his purpose revealed. Huh. That's what happens huh, when you learn how to throw your hands up. Huh. Not only when you lift your hands up, huh, is it a sign of surrender, huh, but I've got good news for you. When you put your hands up, huh, it's a sign of victory. Huh. Ask me how I know. Huh. I'm so glad you asked me. I'm reminded of a story about a movie that came on called Talladega Nights. And it was a story about a man whose name was Ricky Bobby. Ricky Bobby was a race car driver. He was said to be the best there is, the best there was, and the best that there ever would be. But before he got behind the wheels of that race car driver, Ricky Bobby was in the pit somewhere on the sideline. Nobody knew who he was. Nobody knew his name because he was said to be on the side of the pit. But one day, Ricky decided that where he was was not where he was gonna stay. So he left the pit and got behind the wheel of a car. And he began driving. He began going around and going around and going around until finally he won the race. And what stuck out to me is when they was interviewing Ricky Bobby, he kept talking about how he was able to win the race. He talked about how the car rolled smoothly. He talked about how he beat out all of the competition. But while he was talking to the one that was interviewing him, his hands began to go up while he was talking. And so he looked at the man. He said, I'm not really sure what to do with my hands. He said, well, you need to just put them at your side until we get done with the interview because we don't want nothing to distract from the interview process. But the more and more Ricky kept talking, the higher and higher his hands got. What are you saying, Bishop? I came to let you know today it's time to come out of the pit. It's time to get behind the wheel of faith and begin driving around the walls of life. And the minute somebody asks you how you was going to make it, don't be afraid to give your testimony. But while you're giving your testimony, make sure you lift your hands up. Make sure you raise your hand. Make sure you let somebody know that for God I'll live and for God I'll die. Make sure you tell them that I've got the victory in Jesus Christ. And I've got one more word for victory. And that name is Jesus. Victory comes in the name of Jesus. Ask me how I know. I'm so glad you asked me. Because when I'm down, he elevates. When I'm bored, he fascinates. When I'm lonely, he communicates. When I'm sick, he medicates. When I need surgery, he operates. When I'm bored, he communicates. Before I call him, he anticipates. And I'm so glad that can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Wave your hand. Wave your hand. If you know that can't nobody do you like Jesus, wave your hand. Open your mouth. Give God the praise. Shout glory. Holler glory. Yell glory. Shout glory. Shout glory. Hallelujah. To the Lamb. His name is Jesus. One Friday morning.
I need everybody to do me a favor. Because I feel a shift in this place. I need you to grab the hand of somebody next to you. I need everybody. Grab the hand of somebody next to you. Look them dead in the face and tell them, say, neighbor. Tell them again. Tell them, say, neighbor. Say, y'all got some good news. God is getting ready to bless the both of us. Thank you for listening to Purpose of Life Ministries. We hope you enjoy the message. If you would like a copy of this sermon, call our office at 317-925-0335 or visit our website, www.purposeoflifeministries.com. If you're in the Indianapolis area, we would love for you to visit one of our three services on Sunday at 8 a.m., 10 a.m., or noon. We're located at 3705 Kessler Boulevard North Drive in Indianapolis. 